Hello, people. Uh, apart from uh, explaining how to become a cult god, I will, uh, in my 15 minutes, try to uh, give you a brief history of, of Western theater for the last 4,000 years and also solve some of Aristotle's uh, remaining unsolved mysteries for you. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Um, when I first read Aristotle's Poetics as a kid, I was very impressed, of course. But many of the ideas I thought were uh, silly and outdated by modern standards. Uh, one of his axioms was that the chorus in a theater play, uh, a chorus in a tragedy, is the ideal spectator. What the hell? No plays have choruses anymore, and uh, who want to be in the chorus when they can be in the audience or they can be uh, actors? Rubbish, I thought. Uh, but all this comes to a different light when you view it from the, uh, uh, with a li little bit of sense of history of theatre and uh, leading to uh, true Aristotle's times to the modern days, but let's start before Aristotle uh, and before theatre even. This is my... Uh, I took a picture from my, my latest uh, animism class. Uh, that's me. <laughs> animism, in a sense, I think is... is an animistic ritual is where all the people worshipping the god, the bull, essentially become the god. They get the spirit of the bull inside them and hear their, I don't know, also horns on the face. So they're all playing god. And then when you move, uh, have a little bit of a bigger village and a more systematic religion, you get a shaman who becomes the god and you become the worshippers of the god, and, and the shaman who now turns into Dionysus, the bull god, apparently, uh, tells you what the god says. He speaks the words of God. And then moving further into what we might perceive as, as the start of early religion, in this case, early religion in, in Greece. This is uh, Dionysus' worship with a priest turning into Dionysus and the, and the worshippers turning into people who are friends with Dionysus. So Dionysus can actually have a conversation with his followers, even though they, they know that actually, actually it's just the same priest who lives in your neighbor, but right now he's pretending to be a god, and you're pretending to believe it. And uh, furthermore, you can have another actor, let's say it's the Dionysus meeting the King of Thebes, another actor becomes the King of Thebes, and then maybe w at, w at one time you're playing a friend of Dionys Dionysus, and another time you're playing a knight of, of the King of Thebes. And then uh, the, the King of Thebes and Dionysus can actually have a dialogue where they, maybe it's uh, even pre-planned, where they talk about how King of Thebes wants Dionysus out of his kingdom, and Dionysus won't go. And, and everybody, all the worshippers are of course first on one side and then on the other side and they're horrified because the king of thieves makes Dionysus go and Dionysus doesn't want to go and, and you're on this side and then you're on this side and, and you're having a great time but also you're having a, uh, an enormous religious experience. And moving on to a later part of Dionysus' worship, a couple of hundred years before uh, Aristotle, you would actually have the same thing you had earlier with the pre-planned dialogues between the Dionysus and the King of Thebes and the, and the revelers uh, becoming the knights of, of Thebes or, or wives of Dionysus or whatever. But you'd also have a, an audience in a, a, an amphitheater watching, watching the ritual, because actually it's pretty well written and it's, it's this guy, the priest doing Dionysus, is pretty, pretty good. So you actually like watching it, even though you're actually a, you're a, a, an Apollo fan yourself. And sometimes they play these at, uh, these at uh, religious festivals or uh, different sorts of, of gatherings and village markets. And then one step further, and what you get is the classic Greek tragedy, as described by Aristotle, where you have the amphitheater full of thousands or ten thousand, tens of thousands of Athenians and Spartans and uh, Atticans watching actors performing a, a well-written, well-rehearsed play, sometimes about Dionysus, sometimes about 
uh, Medea or uh, other important figures. And then you have the what used to be the worshippers are now the chorus. Uh, why, are, why are they there? You as in the audience, in the amphitheater, you're not really sure anymore. But these guys, they're having a hell of a time. You're just watching it. They're, they're a part of it. They're a part of the story, a part of the, the whole uh, drama. Of course, they're also pre-written, but they, they have these great parts where in the, uh, they can uh, sing and have a dialogue with the, with the actual, actual characters. Fast forward uh, uh, another 1500 years, and what we have is medieval theater with the, with the audience and, and the actors playing Dionysus and the King of Thebes and uh, their friend. <laughs> but what is missing is the chorus. The chorus is gone. And um, granted, since then, this way of doing theater has been honed to perfection. And we don't really need the chorus for this kind of theater. But still, what the audience gets is an outsider's point of view. And, and that's essentially what we still had a, a couple of decades ago with, with television. Only the, the audience, of course, was in home, and the, uh, the priest and, and uh, I mean, the Dionys Dionysus and, and the King of Thebes uh, were in a studio in Cleveland. Um, now, what, what happened to the chorus on the way? Uh, don't we sort of want, it, want to get it back? Or is it fused with the audience? Or, or is, is it lost? Can we bring it back? Do we want to? And if it is the ideal spectator, then shouldn't we want to be in the chorus rather than in the audience? Now, of course, we have new ways of trying to reach the chorus. One of them is, is reality TV. Uh, where you can have sort of interaction, we can, you can phone in and you can have uh, SMS voting and you can even have interactive storylines and, uh, and some sort of participation or web dramas, transmedia and the internet, that kind of stuff. That's one way of trying to have the, bringing the experience of being in a chorus to the non-chorus drama. Another one is, is what people call Oh, sorry. Um, this is another attempt uh, called Soul Fanatics. It's a Finnish, Finnish company trying to create an experience of uh, watching television in your home, watching a sports match in your home, but also becoming a part of this collective of, of sports fans who are also, uh, everybody's commenting on the same match, and they become a sort of a virtual chorus uh, watching over those, the, the king of, of tips and Dionysus. I can't believe he did that, that kind of stuff. Another way is, is actually creating the thing communally, which I guess is not so much replacing the actors or adding a chorus, but it, uh, more about changing the, the, the story and changing Dionysus. It's of course, I'm referring with the picture to the uh, infinite monkey theorem, where if you give a, uh, an infinite number of monkeys and an infinite number of laptops, they will eventually uh, write the tragedy of Hamlet. Actually, this was tested in, uh, uh, in the University of Plymouth uh, in 2003 with uh, six macaques and uh, one typewriter. <laughs> the results, if you're interested in, uh, in them, is um, the monkeys got really excited when they noticed that pressing a key uh, leads to a, a letter being uh, typed by the typewriter. Um, so they, they wrote five pages, almost entirely consisting of the letter S, the, the, uh, and eventually the alpha male uh, crashed the typewriter with a rock and, uh, <laughs> and the monkeys uh, defecated and urinated on the typewriter. <laughs> no, no Hamlet. <laughs> but uh, but I, I think this is uh, exactly what happens when people try to create communally something on the internet. <laughs> so I think it's a pretty good test. Okay, cool. Thank you, but I haven't still solved Aristotle's dilemma. <laughs> I think I have like five minutes left to do that. So here we go. Here goes. I think we have, as LARPers may have stumbled onto something thought forever lost in the West. Maybe we have recreated the chorus. It's not an obvious conclusion since uh, there are some steps in the way, but uh, what I posit is this. 
picture a Dionysus worship ritual with the chorus and the prescripted dialogue between these guys uh, and try to imagine history taking a different direction. You wouldn't add an audience and uh, slowly forget about the chorus. Instead, you would give each person in the chorus a distinct personality. Instead of a member of the King's Warrior, you have a name and a profession and a way to relate to all the other people in the chorus, all the other kings war of the King's Warriors. Now, the shaman who plays Dionysus and, and the other one who plays uh, the King of Thebes, the pre-scripted characters, they would essentially turn into NPCs just there for, for making the experience of being in the chorus a, a better experience. And their importance, I think, would slowly dwindle. I believe that it could have led to LARPing thousands of, of years uh, earlier. Whether it did or not, uh, those are mythical and, and perhaps psychological roots uh, for the experience of being in character. We, we are the descendants of the chorus. We don't like to consider oursel ourselves as spectators since we're so interactive and, and participatory, but according to Aristotle, we are, if you will, the ideal spectator. The next step may well be us losing the characters altogether and uh, all the barriers, all the other barriers between us and, and, uh, and the horned god. And then we can all become gods again. Thank you.